It is a, it's really a great honor for me to introduce His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales as our special guest here today. And that is because uh, he has really been a leader uh, on this issue of forest for many, many years. And long before most of the people in this room, including me myself, started to be engaged in the rainforest, he was putting that on the top of his agenda. So we thank you for what you have done for so many years in really making the rainforest to an important international issue. I'm also glad to say that uh, I attended a meeting in London which uh, you convened, uh, I think it was two years ago, with world leaders. And that was an important meeting because it was the first meeting with uh, so many world leaders gathered in one room and we decided to go on with the rainforest agenda and that meeting was actually one important part of the process which led us to this uh, conference here in Oslo today and the partnership we are establishing uh, today. So it's a really great honor to welcome you and please welcome His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Welcome. Prime Minister Stoltenberg, uh, Presidents and uh, Prime Ministers, ladies and gentlemen. Three years ago, when um, the experts warned me of the disastrous situation facing the world's rainforests, and uh, I felt I simply had to try and help find a solution to the urgent problem of tropical deforestation, the world was a different place. We were riding high on a global economic boom uh, with only a few brave souls seeing the lengthening shadows. Uh, the world's tropical forests were about 36 million hectares larger than they are today. Uh, our planet was populated by approximately 80,000 more species. As I said in Brazil last March, back then, uh, we had only 100 months left in which to take the necessary action to avoid irreversible catastrophic climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, we, only, we now have only 86 months left before we reach the tipping point. Now hindsight is, is, is a wonderful thing and has vindicated those of us, many of whom are here today, uh, who have been ringing the alarm bells with ever greater vigor about the need to prevent the catastrophes of climate change and ecosystem collapse. However, the great positive difference between the summer of 2007 and today uh, is that we now have a serious group of governments with none showing greater leadership than Norway who are prepared to work together to find a durable solution which will effectively tackle uh, the drivers of tropical deforestation. As um, I said at the high-level opening of the Copenhagen uh, Climate Summit last December, the time we have available to translate aspiration into action is fast running out. The Paris-Oslo process is, if I may say so, an outstanding uh, some might say the outstanding success of Copenhagen. And I can only applaud the fact that we are setting the seal on the uh, creation of genuine partnerships which will help to make the world's remaining tropical forests worth more alive than dead. And incidentally, uh, Prime Minister, it has been immensely heartening to learn only yesterday evening that a groundbreaking agreement has been reached between Norway and Indonesia to turn the Paris-Oslo process into an effective reality in terms of the Red Plus partnership. I can only offer, for what it's worth, my warmest congratulations to Prime Minister Stoltenberg and President Yutoyono uh, for such wonderful, far-sighted leadership. I'm immensely touched too, Prime Minister, that you should have considered inviting me to speak 
um, at this meeting and uh, indeed greatly relieved if in some small way my efforts, including the meeting of heads of state in government, and government which I hosted last April in London, it wasn't two years ago, uh, might have helped to facilitate dialogue leading to the concrete results we uh, celebrate today. Ladies and gentlemen, it, it seems to me that one of the strengths of the partnership agreement being launched here is the scope it offers for a properly joined up holistic approach. I mean, you will know far better than me that solutions which join all the dots are long lasting solutions. Uh, there are three critical points which all my uh, somewhat limited experience tells me are vital for the successful implementation of the Paris Oslo process and which if you could bear it I would just like to share with you. The first and I'm sure entirely self-evident truth is that just as the main cause of tropical deforestation is agriculture, so any solution must embrace the needs of the agricultural sector. Uh, in recognition of this, and uh, as part of the continuation of my rainforest project, workshops are being held in Asia, Africa, and Latin America to facilitate a dialogue between the forestry and agricultural sectors and to make certain that the opportunity costs of behavioral change are recognized and understood. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is, is certainly not enough. In a, in a world where food security is likely to become an ever more pressing concern and where the development of the rural sector will be an increasing priority, it is absolutely vital that agricultural production can be maintained and, if necessary, increased, but not, not in a way which undermines the ability of vital ecosystems to replenish themselves. This is nature's capital. For even if no more forests were felled, and if all the hundreds of millions of acres of productive but fallow land were brought into production, and the 30% of post-harvest waste eliminated, we would still face the challenge of the unsustainability of current agricultural or agri-industrial practices, to be more exact. These are partly responsible for the annual loss of somewhere between 70,000 to 140,000 square kilometers of arable land through soil erosion and land degradation. So if we are to have any hope of making the agricultural sector economically resilient, then it has to have far, far better ecological resilience than it currently has. And in this United Nations year of biodiversity, we should surely look at the systemic changes that are required in our use of nature's capital. And this very much includes the forestry and agricultural sectors if the supporting web of life upon which we all depend, ladies and gentlemen, whether we like it or not, is not to be irretrievably broken. One of the uh, many lessons that I've learned from over 25 years of working in this area is how essential it is to engage the public, private, and NGO sectors in dialogue, thereby helping to build a partnership approach. That is certainly the best way of ensuring that any emerging consensus actually withstands the test of time. Secondly, this systemic approach is going to require some degree of oversight as part of the failure of our present system is our almost willful determination to keep everything resolutely in separate silos. For this reason, I was delighted to learn that Australia, France, uh, and Papua New Guinea have been kind enough to undertake initial efforts to collate information on the various uh, forest support programs around the world. This seems to be the bare minimum of what is needed if, for no other reason, that in this period of increased stringency, governments will need to know that every dollar made available will be spent wisely in order to avoid any unnecessary duplication and to ensure that the reduction in tropical deforestation 
leads to the maximum contribution to countries sustained and sustainable economic growth. Such a coordinated approach will also lead to an increase in the level of trust that something can happen and indeed is happening. Thirdly, given the precarious economic situation in which so many countries find themselves, I've been heartened by the readiness of rainforest countries to work on a payment uh, on performance basis. This can only increase confidence. With uh, incredible advances in monitoring and increased coordination among those who specialize in monitoring, reporting, and evaluation, there is no lack of capacity. And I know that in this regard, Brazil has been immensely helpful in uh, offering its services to other countries. Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by thanking you once again for inviting me to join you today. I can only offer you my most uh, heartfelt congratulations on a process which may, I suspect, be seen by history as a vital step towards saving the world's tropical forests and our collective future. Thank you, Prime Minister.